Hello, everybody. Welcome to Aquarius Rising and happy Monday. And it's Eclipse Day. And guess what? We're still here. <laughs> Did you doubt? <laughs> Did you know we are still here? Australia, you guys are a good few hours ahead, so the world is not blown up yet. I'm here. It's o'clock in the morning for me. And uh, we are still around. And in fact, I intend to shine throughout this eclipse and thereafter as well. So, you know, we could use things in the way that we want We want to use them, actually. Yeah. Um, I think God intends everything for good. So we will yeah. use it to our full advantage. And none of this nonsense about, I don't even know what it is. But everyone is, yeah, well, I wouldn't say. There's a lot of people that are so scared of this eclipse. I'm like, come on. Anyway, it's really good to have you two beautiful Aussies. Yeah, I've been sitting, and I want to just tell the listeners, I've been sitting in the background, and I eventually had to tell them to keep quiet because they insist on making me jealous. They're planning road trips and all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, my God, it's not whatever <laughs> hey, I, re I reckon Joan and I should do a Thelma and Louise what do you reckon Joan I'll come down and pick you up in the mini <laughs> all right we'll tape it we'll start oh, our own series oh, oh dead set yeah I can do that yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely <laughs> I'm gonna find that portal I told you I'm gonna go I'm gonna find that portal there. I'm gonna fly through it today you think you're feeding your joeys in the morning and there I am. <laughs> I might be a little bit banged up and everything, but I tell you, I'll be there. You know what we okay. can do? You know what we can do? We can take a photo of Chantel, mm. blow it up, and we can put her in the back seat. And we can talk to her if she's there. And you know what? Yes. That's like a good idea. You like that? Oh, that's perfect. I do. I do. I do. We would have fun. We wouldn't exclude you, Chantel, no, at all. No, 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 no. It's so lovely to have you two. I've got to tell you, definitely two of my favorite people. And um, it's such a pleasure to have you on, both of you. Um, and, you know, both of you amazing women are doing incredible things in Australia. I love it. I love it. I love it. I got to tell you, I absolutely love it. So for me to have you two ladies here chatting about your experiences, and yeah, and this is certainly the first, but it ain't going to be the last show we do together, um, all three of us, that's for sure, because I do believe there's power in numbers as well. So when we sit and we gather and we have these amazing times together, I think it really is super powerful. And I think it's amazing what healing that brings. I mean, I know just in the time, Kerry, that you've been on my show, and Joanne recently as well, how many people have individually reached out to you, ladies, and, um, you know, and have just wanted to get to know you, get to know what you're doing. Um, I know you've been speaking to a number of people as well, um, you know, off air and behind the scenes. I think it is absolutely incredible, and I feel privileged to be sitting here with you and it's a great pleasure to have Aquarius Rising um, offer this platform, you know, because that's what it's about. So I want to hear, now I'm going to actually sit back and I would love to hear from the two of you and, you know, the topic is disassociation, repressed memories and healing after SRA and any type of abuse or violence. It doesn't have to necessarily be SRA but um, SA, you know. So I would love to hear from you. So Joanne, I'm going to open up the floor for you first since she's sitting on the top there. And how are you doing? Um, how are you feeling? What's been happening with you in the last few days as well? Um, well, as usual, we've been, well, I've been extremely busy here at Home Farm looking after all those joeys, not, not rubbing it in, but um, and having lots of cuddles and kisses and doing my gardens, all that. But I actually stopped and took some time to look into my experiences and how disassociation saved my life in its own way. And repressed memories do the same as well. So I've had time to sit and reflect 
and write some things down. And when you disassociate, I think the most important thing to know, and I'm sure, Kerry, you'll agree, is the person that is disassociating isn't always aware they're actually disassociating. It's the people around that, yeah, your support system and understand who help you to make that eye contact come back to the here and now. Because disassociation, disassociating is a way the brain gets you through that experience of trauma so you can get to the end of it and still be sane and function as a normal human being um, in the like in the here and the now. Um, but that's where I wanted to start. Um, what do you think, Carrie? Oh, definitely. Um, mm. I mean, I probably was dissociating a lot, had a clue about it. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't even know what dissociation was until I was way, like, you know, in my 30s. And um, definitely people around me didn't have a clue what was happening to me. Um, once I started having all the flashbacks and I'd have these really weird um, things, which I now know as a dissociation, um, and I got to the right counsellor who was able to explain it to me, yeah. I I then started to reflect back, you know, from especially through my marriage and, and I started to figure out what my triggers were. And mm. my biggest trigger was um, in just feelings, like just certain feelings. Um, and, um, of course, you know, after I... Um, uh, had all the assaults at work and the car accident, it was then that I had, I found I had uh, specific trigger words or specific situations that obviously uh, mirrored or have some connection to any of the assaults for me growing up. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I became aware. Sometimes you don't even know what it is. Like you just know that you know, I mean, I've had experiences where I'm driving the car because I was anxious, PTSD, anxiety, and I had to go somewhere and I had to build myself up to get in the car and drive and I'm halfway there and I started to feel really weird and then at first I thought, what's wrong with me, you know, and next minute I could see my hands on the steering wheel but my it was like my body and my brain weren't connected and I got to my destination and I could just barely coordinate to drive the car into the car spot. And then I went to step out of the car, nothing would work. <laughs> so my legs wouldn't work and anything. And, and you know, you um, you just kind of want to, your eyes don't come up, they just want to go down and you're going into it like a complete withdrawal. And I couldn't speak, like I can't. My speech would sometimes come out quite broken and mm. other times nothing at all. And if I wasn't careful, what would happen was the dissociation, if it was really bad or I'd been really triggered, I would go into a very triggered episode. So I would relive whatever that trauma was. Feelings and all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Have That's you had, right. have you had similar, have you, sorry, I was going to ask you, Joan, have you had like similar type? Because I can imagine, you know, physically, um, it would definitely, as you said, you know, that your legs don't work, your whole body feels like it's a jellyfish or numb or just no coordination or something like that. I can imagine that. How long does it take for you to start feeling normal again? And what does it bring you? Uh, what 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 is necessary? How do you bring yourself into that state of feeling whole again, if I can put it that way, where your body can start working, you know, like you can walk, you can feed your limbs and all of that what do you need to do in order to get back to that place would you like me to answer first joe mm, okay. yes please I'd like I, to hear that. um it took me a while to really grasp what was happening to me because the flashbacks were really severe like really debilitating where i had to i was given antipsychotic drugs to pull me back to keep me safe that was in the early stages um, as I started and worked through and started to understand, I could actually feel myself going into a dissociative state. So I would learn little techniques and that would be um, counting backward from 100 or um, grounding yourself. They call it grounding. So I would um, look at an object 
in the room and I would try and um, just talk about it in the sense of the shape, the colour and everything. So it could be a, a bottle of water that had writing on it. Um, changing things up. If I was sitting in a particular seat or in an area, I would remove myself from that area and I would try and normalise everything, like go and make a cup of coffee, change the subject, put something on TV that's funny or go for go walk outside on the grass and pat the dog or something like that. So um, right. in some cases, um, I'd have to resort to take an Valium. Now, it was very funny for me. I mean, everybody can be different with dissociation. I would get very tired, right? It was like, it, like I'd taken a Valium, right? But I, when I took a Valium, I had the opposite effect. So I would actually come back to myself again. So people take Valium and go to sleep. I would take it and it would pull me out and I don't have to take one and I would feel back myself. In saying that, the, I, I've dissociated practically for days. It de really depended on, and there was nothing but other than sleep that brought me out of it. So I just had to find a way to sleep and or it would just shut me down and I would sleep. So it depends. You could be in it for a few minutes to, a, to for me, to a few days. And sometimes things really worked well. Sometimes things didn't. Uh, in saying that, like, man, compared to where I was, like, it's not very often now that it would actually happen to me and I'm generally pretty good at getting on top of it fairly quickly. Um, it, the more you work at it, the more that you work on healing and the more you work on integrating, like why you dissociate in the first place and working on those altered parts, the, the less dissociation actually occurs. So... Right. Mm, wow. That's so true. It really is. Like when I first started disassociating, well, I didn't really first start it. I think when I first came aware of it, mm. that it was actually a thing and I was doing it, I always had this feeling that every now and then I was there in this world and the world was going on around me, but it was ever so slow, ever so slow. It was the most, I loved being in that. I really loved being in it because everything around me was slowed and I could cope with that. Yeah. And then I had time to like interject and change it. But then there was there's times when I would disassociate, like you days, sometimes weeks I was hospitalized when I was in those states. And I actually was had a guard on me. 24 7 because because i just where would i go what would i do nobody knows not even me um and i found that hard i had to be put on some psychotic medications just to help me on that side of it and i had good people around me that knew my condition and cared this was um when i was in my late 30s and 40s so I didn't know much and didn't have the support before that. And then, like, disassociating, I'm outside of my body. My favourite place was on the ceiling. And I'd watch the body do what it's doing, walk around, um, achieve its chores. It would sort of register in my brain, if you like. Oh, okay, you know, the body's done that. Don't have to worry about that. Tick it off. But to come back into my body... And to integrate was a very painful experience for me because I fought it. I wanted yeah. to stay out. Yeah. I didn't want to go back in because if I did, everything I'd gone through, all those feelings, all those, the rapes, the beatings, the, you name it, all of it was all there in that body. Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't something you do consciously. You do it. And when you're out, there's no pressure. So, but my children were really great too because they learnt along with me and I never hid anything from them. And even my daughter, when she was young in primary school and she'd say I was disassociating, she would say to me in a quite a nice assertive voice, Mum, look into my eyes, it's Jessica. 
mum and she was wonderful she still is and Daniel's the same and so I had that and I had the support around me and I got very good support and friends that helped me a long way they didn't always understand and I still sometimes disassociate and yeah. in fact the last couple of days as I, I was looking at my repressed memories and the theory and all that behind that and I've got to a point with it um, it comes from Sigmund Freud and my brain has cut that off. Mm. My brain won't let me go further. My brain will shut it down yeah. because if I go further, then I relive it like you. I relive it, every bit of it. Yeah. And I don't want yeah. to. And, you know, I might be cleaning house sometimes even today and suddenly I'll just feel this anger well up in me and I'll start crying and get very angry. And it's I stand there and I go, what? What is this? There's nothing. And my life's good. Everything's fine. What's triggered? And that's in the process of going back. What was I doing? Okay, I was cleaning the toilet. And it happens a lot when I clean the toilet because there's abuse connected yeah. to that. You know, so I've got to have it so that the doors open and the smell of it doesn't get me. And I don't use the same cleaning products at all. But... If the door's closed or it closes with the wind or my little dog does it, that's it, Joanne's triggered. And it takes a while to come back from that and then I've got to live those feelings. And then I've got to take the time to care for me. And I'm such, well, I want to get things done and I've got a schedule and I like my little lists and, and then I berate myself because I've done this and it's wasted time. Then I've got to come back to, well, it's not a waste of time. It's okay, you know, and and even Tony says today, but you don't need, Joey, you don't need to do it all in one day. You know, you got to look after you. So I think we experience very similar, and it's not unusual that we no. have. And it could be anything, a smell, a song, yeah, the breeze, the rustling of a tree, anything. Yeah, a and word. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I wanted to ask you. I love your rooster, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, I've got a few. They're rescues. What can I say? <laughs> They're allowed. <laughs> Definitely making their voices heard. It's so adorable. I love it. Reminds me of my farm days, that's for sure. Anyway, oh, I wanted to. <laughs> Obviously, sort of the repressed memories, I think, in the dissociation in the hand, right? So I would imagine that uh, maybe if there's a memory, a repressed memory that pops up, and that could be then triggered by, let's say, a smell, a song, uh, something that would remind you, and then that memory might come up. Is that when disassociation happens for you as well? Does it go yeah. hand in hand? Yeah, definitely. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Even places. Sorry, Kerry, I'm rude. I was but even say, places. Yeah. Mm. I'm opposite to Joan. I hate associating. I detest it with a vengeance. So when I start to go into it, I hate, and I do, I berate myself because I'm in it. And the longer I'm in it, the worse I feel because it just you know, Four days could pass and nothing gets mm. done. You're just kind of trying to function and you feel like you haven't really achieved anything at all. But something's trying to come in. So it's about, it's about being kind to yourself and allowing yourself that period of time to to investigate and, and to, to nurture it. And for me, like as I was forced to work with a child, so that old um, that that old um, uh, messaging is, you know, pushing yourself going, you know, and I have to override that. I'm thankful I do have some people around me that um, support me and kind of keep reiterating it's okay, Kerry, to do nothing if you if you're just sitting in it for a few days. So yeah, but I hate it. Um, I, I used to panic the first time it used to happen. I used to go on an absolute panic state that it would even occur because I didn't like it. Yeah, still don't mm. like it. I don't panic anymore, so that's good. 
Yeah. It's it's a liking and the fact that there's no pressure. Mm. And I'm not feeling, I suppose, I should really clarify that a bit more. Um, yeah, it's because I don't have to face it at that moment. And mm. if I stay there, I don't have to keep facing it. But ultimately, coming back and facing it is the victory, you know, to help and release it and let it go. Um, but, yeah. I still struggle with that even today, though, Kerry, when I'm in it. You know, I want to stay there. There's no pressure. But, oh, okay. of course, I, I do come back and I do face it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hate doing it. I hate dealing with the pain, but you've got to. But for me, yeah. it was, uh, and as I've been story, um, you know, and the more I've shared about my whole life, it, it was sort of like there was nobody around me whenever anything bad was happening to me. Even the people mm. that loved me never did anything to protect me. So um, for me as an adult, it's been very hard for me to trust people to help me navigate this stuff. Um, in, you know, so, I wanted to ask you there, um, yeah. how did you learn? Because, in fact, that was something that came up with on our conversation on Friday with you, Joe, and when we were mm. speaking about learning to trust, you know, it's one thing, mm. you know, getting to trust people in your environment. Because I think, Joanne, you've been so blessed as well to have a loving partner husband beautiful children as well and i think kerry probably the same for you maybe maybe not initially um from what i recall but um how was it for you to how did you learn to trust good people because i think in my what i would imagine is that when you're in that environment as a child right not one adult is coming to your defense. Not one, whether it's the church, whether it's you, whether it's your parents, whether it's your aunties or your uncles, there's not one adult coming. Okay. She's on freeze mode. She is. Mm -hmm. But she's beautiful. Look at her. Yeah. <laughs> no. so, yeah. Hey, Maybe it's a time. Oh, <laughs> we were going to say something already then. <laughs> we're good girls, Kerry. Yeah. I can see myself can freeze there, like, okay. But anyway, so what I'm saying is there was just, you know, from, yeah, there's not one adult that, that is trustworthy. So it must be quite a bit to learn who the humans are that you can trust in the world around you again, right? Whether it's a partner, uh, children maybe, you know, I think some children are amazing. I've also heard other stories where children haven't been that amazing, you know? I think it just depends on the individual, but I would love to, to know how you learn how to trust again, because that is such a big step forward in your life, is the trust. Yeah. I think for me is that I didn't realise really that I wasn't trusting people. It, it might sound a bit weird, but because um, my, my life is so screw with, it, it, you think you're putting yourself out there, but you're not. And it's very hard for adopted people because we've had to learn to mask so much and put on a show. And um, so... I don't even know how much of myself I was real as a young person. So, um, uh, so yeah. So I can't I can't overly answer that. I found it extremely hard to trust even as an adult. And even though there are probably people around me who really wanted to help, I was still really withholding lots of information. And then I when I went off to counselling, I'd be there for over a year, and then I'd find. <laughs> Well, counsellors having a meltdown going, you're just telling me this now? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Because it takes a long time, generally, for me. Um, but it really depends on the person. Like, there are some people I really um, drawn to that I feel that I can trust, but 
that it's not a lot of people, right? It's it's a very small um, number, like you know, I can count it on one hand that I would really share stuff with. So, yeah. uh, or I'll only share so much and withhold uh, lots of other information. So, um, yeah, uh, I probably have one person in particular that knows everything about me that I really, really, really trust. And that was the person that those dissociative parts felt safe to share with her and no one else. So, mm. yeah. It's quite discernment. You've got to use a lot of discernment. And, you know, I still get it wrong today. I yeah. still want to be able to trust people. And yeah. I think to myself, well, yeah, I'm trusting you because you're trustworthy. And then I find out. Oh, hang on a minute, I got it wrong again. And um, it's it's hard work. Mm. It's really hard work. Yeah. And I think because of what we grew up with, that there were so many dysfunctional people and abusive people around us, sometimes mm. our older parts will trust the wrong people for the wrong reasons because it's familiar. I don't know about you, Joan, but that's how yeah, I felt. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, we and then, create what we had. Correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you kind of like, why? <laughs> why did yeah. I not say that? Because one part was probably more in the game than you than the other parts were. And and that's it. The window and open parts, there are parts that don't tell you information. They can be very separate from themselves, where others can be aware of other parts. So, you know, it's it's you know, when you're really allow yourself um, to open up and go into counselling and you really start looking at these parts, you realise you're not just one whole person. You're, you're, you're like a jigsaw puzzle parts of other parts that retain different memories and different traumas and somehow you've got to get them to open up and talk to each other and talk to the adult part and then sometimes those altars can be in um, contention with each other. Like I was telling a while back um, to Chantel that I had one part that was really strong, would put me in a lot of risky situations and really push, push, push to strive. And then I had a really weak part that would just want to give up all the time, you know? So there was this constant. And this is where I had that weak part just wanted to suicide all the time. Yeah. And the other part's like, get up, you know, like, no, <laughs> get up, stop it. And uh, so it was really hard. But allowing yourself to um, really delve into those bits is so important for healing. It, it you know, yeah. it's scary. Um, it, it's really bizarre this, as well. Like you, you, you open yourself up to a whole world inside your mind that you just never knew existed at all, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And they have to make peace with each other. Like those older parts <laughs> need to make peace with each other and sometimes that's not easy. Um, that's, what, that's what I actually wanted to ask you as well because I can imagine when you start having your flashbacks and you, I think it would be the, the again the body's natural way or the mind's natural way to protect you is to disassociate, right? Mm. So when you're having that, so and then coming to over time, coming to the realization of how to bring right. yourself back and also to deal with the flashbacks in a way that you can start facing them and start loving yourself through mm. your pain. Because yeah. I think that really, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, despite how many people are in our circle and in our vicinity, you know, you can have a loving partner, you can have loving kids, you can have a great therapist or a healer, whatever it is. At the end of the day, it really is, the onus is on us mm. to love ourselves through the pain, to love ourselves through our traumas our shame our humiliation our grief and that really is for me what i've noticed in in my career doing what i'm doing that's the most important thing you are the person that has to hold your own hand most securely 
you are, yeah. is, I hope she comes on. You are the person that has to love yourself the most. You are the person that has to believe in yourself the most. You yeah. know, um, and that is why I do believe it is so important to surround yourself with people who love you, who care mm. for you, you can trust, who are there to hold your hand through the tough times. You know, none of us are perfect. You know, no. uh, we all have our shit at the end mm. of the day. Um, but I think it's really, that's what it boils down to. And if we can start that process of just sitting with ourselves and God, you know, for mm. me, that's what it's always about. It's me and God. That's yeah. it. And what do I need to do through this? And that's where prayer comes in. And that's where prayer, meditation, um, alignment are so important to be able to take ourselves through times and uh, uh, times and places and situations that are seemingly impossible, right? Mm -hmm. I really think for me that that's what the most important thing is. So, <clears throat> on the path to healing, and I want to hear from both of you regarding that, what do you find has been the most important thing that has helped you heal? Joanne, I'll ask you first. I'm believing that I'm loved has been my biggest thing that has helped me to heal. And that's come from my children more than anywhere else. Right. They are the ones that I keep saying to me, but mum, you're not repulsive. Mum, you were a good mum. Mum, you're okay. Don't sabotage yourself. And I think um, when I get fragmented, which I am now, because I disappeared for a minute, mm. I might hand over to Kerry if you don't mind. I'll just sit for a minute. All right. Thanks. All good. All okay. good. Kerry. All right. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what was the most important uh, what was the most important ingredient if you will whether it's something or someone that has helped you along the way i mean i'm seeing some amazing people in the chats here as well yes who've, who've clearly been through similar stuff right yeah and um so what would be the most important or one of the most important things in your journey to healing yeah, look, um, I think like the same here. My, my, if I didn't have children, I don't think I would be here. That's as simple as that. Um, I, and I think for me, the realization that Kerry the child deserved healing or mm -hmm. Kerry the child deserved a voice, Kerry the child, like she did such a great job helping me to survive that I owed her to keep fighting in those really bad, bad times as an adult when I was triggered. And if she got me as a vulnerable, broken child through all that crap as an adult, mm. you know, I wanted to honour that child and find a way to give her what she never had as a child. Like, because that carry part will always be a part of me that never goes away. And I remember uh, being adopted, right, and because I've been given a name that's not an original name, that's not my blood name, and I came to a, a crossroads in my life where um, I had so many flashbacks and I just um, thought I need to get rid of my name. Like I hate it. I hate the name and I hate what it's associated with. But when it really came down to it, I realised that if I did that, then I was treating her no differently than what everybody else did. I was discarding her. And Kerry was the one that got me through it. So I then embraced her and decided that I wanted to honour her and give her the, the, the life that she deserved. So right. that's how I saw that's it, good. yeah. That is yeah. so well that's put, good. yes. Yeah. Very much so, and that that love so important, isn't it, to actually start believing yourself and loving yourself. Mm. Mm. Oh, definitely. Inner child healing, that inner yeah. child healing, is so yeah. important. Yeah. To, you yeah. Know, to to realize, and I and and I love what you said there, Kerry, as well. It's like 
for the for for you to realize that the little child in you deserves protection that little kid that was completely vulnerable to these freaking monsters and had no protection um deserves protection now and you know i don't know if you guys know caroline mace's work but she is a fantastic intuitive healer and she speaks about the archetypes the human archetypes as well and there's four archetypes that we all have and one of them is the child the inner child or the wounded child and you know whether whether i mean i can imagine with with guys with, with what you guys have experienced it is so amplified the wounds and the pain and the fear and the non-trusting and stuff like that so it's so important that even at this age you know where we all mothers and grandmothers that inner child in you that little person and and still needs to have encouragement nurturing mm. nourishment love yeah. protection and that is why and that's what our going back to what i was saying as well earlier on it's like the only person who can really love us through that is us ourselves and, and you're missing an important you missing an important ingredient chanto yeah i am yeah mm -hmm. it's called fun <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly I, I, it's I, so important it's so important yeah but you have to have it sometimes you don't know yeah, Sometimes yeah. You don't. no yeah. and i was i was deprived because i had to work so much yeah. as a child and grow up and i love having fun now over christmas i took some nerf guns and bought some nerf bullets and i shot up my grandkids and we had a great time all the adults sat around being adults yeah. i was in with the kids shooting the crap out of them and it was fun and I don't apologize for that because it like not hurting anybody. Right? Yeah. And it's not, you know, it wasn't like I was being stupid fun. It was fun, fun, childlike fun. And there are, there are three ego types. It's childlike, childish or childless. And we will skip between each of those. Right. But being childlike is where I like to sit a lot because it's that innocent play right and being spontaneous mm. right and i think it's important to connect with that and i will have I, look i've got a little dog around here I, we will play tiggy through the house and hide and seek you know these these are the things that really um it's, it does something for me to connect with the animals in that way to just play and connect with them it really grounds me in a really special way. And it's then when I also really connect with God in that way as well. The innocence you know? of the child is so important. Yeah, I fully yeah. agree. I say to people, yeah. as, you know, um, when, when, when we do the inner child work, like, okay, so your parents never bought you a bicycle when you were a kid. You, you're 40 now. Go buy your own bicycle. Hmm? Go ride it in the park. Right? You can give it to yourself now. You wanted to go for horse riding lessons. Well, go, go, go for horse riding lessons now. There's lots of stables here. Buy yourself a few lessons, and if you can, then you're going to buy yourself a horse, you know, stuff like mm. that. So you can give yourself the things now that you weren't given as yes. a child. And even if you have to put wheels on the side of your bicycle <laughs> and, and everyone is laughing at you that's okay right yeah yeah just definitely. Go do what i did and go down a slippery dip on a scooter because i did that and i broke my ankle that's when i <laughs> 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 uh, it's the funny story god mum stop <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is a funny story did it a long time ago but it was just one of those moments where my 10 year old child was going gee mum I don't think this is a good idea and I bypassed him <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. it was very embarrassing at the time because I should have been the adult <laughs> and, 
I'm sitting in the back of the car with my foot on top of my 10-year-old son while my girlfriend's driving me in the hospital. My 10-year-old child is patting my foot, looks at me, and he goes, and you want a motorbike? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Just love it. That is so gorgeous. <laughs> you had to be the child, stuff like that. Exactly. That yeah. fun, that laughter. It's it's so important to be able and yeah. I mean just to be able to laugh, you know, yeah. to be able to put on something funny on the TV, like you never were allowed to watch cartoons. And I go and sit in front of cartoon television for a whole day and laugh your ass off or watch yeah. as many cartoons as you like, you know. Give it to yourself. All the things that that you were not enti or entitled to or given as a child, now you give them to yourself. I mean, I think that is really, and it's a process, you know. It's never just a, a um, I mean, I always wanted to do ballet, and my father wouldn't let me because he was six kids, and he said he couldn't afford it because if, he, if I did ballet, then all the other kids had to do ballet. I said, no, that's not true, you know. <laughs> but now, so, and then I was complaining to one of my friends, um, one of my old school friends, in fact, and she was a real, she went ballet, ballet dancer way into adulthood, did really well for herself. And um, I said to her, she, she says, well, what's wrong with you? Join an adult ballet class. And I went, that's actually a great idea, but I, I do yoga instead. So now instead of doing the ballet, I do the yoga, which is like ballet in another way anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know, but just to know we have a choice. I think yeah. that is the most important thing that you actually have a choice yes. to do things differently now and to do what the hell you bloody like, right? Yeah. You don't yeah. have to have someone else's permission to do yeah. things. You can have chocolate cake, three times a day, breakfast, mm. lunch, and dinner. And there's literally no one policing that. And yeah. that's what yeah. you can do, you know? Yeah. And I think that for me is what's important. And most certainly laughter, you know? And yeah. even if that means putting on a funny kitten cartoon or something, and that's oh, what yeah. we do. I think that is, wow. such, a, that is such a big, big um, step forward to doing some healing. Yeah, absolutely. There was a, I saw today, it was on TikTok, so I don't know, I didn't get the name of the doctor, but she did a study into her blood, right? And apparently when she was really sad, her blood looked like tears, right? Mm. And when she was angry, the blood clumped together. When she prayed, right, the blood lit up like a light. Wow. I just thought that was amazing and I just thought if I could have grabbed the doctor's name, I would have researched it. But to me, I felt like that was true, I feel, because everything mm. that we go through does affect our bodies. It affects every, all our cells. So I think that's really important. Like, And I think for me that's why laughter amongst everything has been so important to me because it's been balancing out all the crap. So I've got to be absolutely hysterically funny because I've been through a lot of crap. <laughs> yeah. And we use that laughter or that that quick wittedness to yeah. diffuse anything that's going on around us too. I know yeah. I do that. And because yeah. if you can bring that laughter into it, there's safety in it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Mm. So, yeah, wow. Absolutely. Laughter yeah. is good medicine, yes. And uh, Charmaine oh. reckons we're a hoot. If you can have a look at Charmaine's comment, she said, you girls are a hoot. And then oh. she goes, I want a three-wheel bike. And then I want a three-wheel motorcycle as well as laughter is good medicine. Yeah. So very good. Well, and Lisa, I, 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 what I did, when, especially when, when I was in Thailand, I bought myself these e-wheels. It's like a single wheel, but it's battery yes. operated. I'm, You've got it. I just call it my wheelie, it's an e-wheel. But wow, what an amazing! You ride that thing. <laughs> That's the dog. Sorry. It. It's all good. 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 <laughs> um, it's noisy, it's yeah. an amazing experience. You get on this thing, and you—it's like flying. It's like low flying, and it's just incredible. I do the morning before everyone's here. You know on the roads etc but it's really an amazing feeling 
going outside, exercising, you know, or if you're just walking, being in nature. You know, I just think everything in life is a balance. And, you know, absolutely getting back, you know, and there's certain friends that one has, you know, where you just sit and you laugh your ass off yeah. for the entire day. And you can yeah. be the most, you know, and these are usually your childhood friends, right? Um, where you can talk about the ridiculous things. You can absolutely just enjoy life. And I agree, Charmaine, do it. Absolutely do it. Get that three-wheel motorcycle, go riding, mm. fall off, enjoy, enjoy it. Well, I taught <laughs> myself, I went, I went and bought myself a skateboard in my 50s and I mm. uh, learned how to skateboard. And so I have um, what they call a, um, uh, a, a long board and it has a kahuna stick so I don't have to step off the push. So it's a bit like, you know, um, what is it, paddle boarding but on land. And I taught myself how to do that. So it was great fun, you know. Well done. Well yeah, done. Just anything, you know. Anything that your parents didn't allow you to do, <laughs> just do it. Do now. See, I remember I just, as a child that there was a time it was Christmas time and we were our cousins and they got bikes for Christmas. And because we didn't get a bike or weren't allowed near the bike, we literally were threatened to have both our arms and legs broken if we even went near it. So one of the first things I did after I got married was buy a bike. Because I loved it, you know. And there's other things like but the restrictions put on us and even you still find it hard, though, to say, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You deserve that. But you do. You come to a place like before I, we went live, I was playing throw the ball for my little dog that is, you can hear in the background. And I was dancing sort of with her and saying, which way am I going to throw it? And I mean, I'm like a, like a, I don't know, teenager having good old fun with her. And I'm learning to do that more and more in everything I'm doing. To have that fun, and it's okay and it's safe with me and Miss Poppy because yeah. that's our thing, and no one's around, you know. Yeah. So, 50 is the yeah. new 30, babe. 50 is the new 30. I tell you, we're about to see that. Oh, like, sure. oh yeah. <laughs> well, I, had, I had something similar, Joan. My mm. adopted father would give my belongings away so. He used to complain about feeding and clothing me and giving me anything. And my adoptive mother would, um, you know, bought me a, a food plate, but it would have been so beat up. And any anyway, moment it would be gone. He would have given it to his mate, kids. So nothing oh. was mine. As far as he was concerned, nothing was mine. Everything was his. Yes, I know that one. Like we used to do also in our teen years, um, we season work tomato picking okay. in the orchards. Yeah. And he'd have all of us up there doing that, but none of us got paid. It all belonged. Yeah, you're yeah. understanding that. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's it's things we missed out on very interesting like i loved yogurt but i was never allowed to have it that and if i ever bought it and he ever found out this is when i was working and i was still living at home um he would make sure he ate it even though he hated the stuff because how mm. dare i have it yeah, yeah so but now we do we do a lot of what we didn't do back then and we changed it and we changed it up for our children yeah definitely we really, i did i think i overcompensated yeah. Um, but they're beautiful adults. They're both responsible, you know, with their own families. They are beautiful young people. But I think it's so easy to overcompensate in the situation you've come from. You know, in many ways, because I was boarding school from the age of five. You know, um, we lived on the farm. That's why we we went to boarding school when we went to school type thing. So, and I know with my son as well, I mean, if I had to reverse, if I could reverse back 37 years now, I would definitely do it differently because I was, you know, I was a single mom, but his dad wasn't involved in his life. So yeah. I had to be mom and dad. So, and because he's a super smart kid and super stubborn, nothing like me. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. it was not, yeah. none of those qualities were mine whatsoever. 
Right. We love it's you almost sometimes. Like I took on, <laughs> it's almost like I had to take on that masculine role. And yeah. I took it on. And, you know, it's been amazing because he's actually such a sensitive kid. And that caused issues between us. But nothing that it took one conversation to change that. It took one conversation between us when we were kind of talking and doing our healing work together. I took one conversation between him and I, and I explained to him, and there's a big difference between explaining something, clarifying something, and justifying it. And mm -hmm. I've had to learn the difference between justifying myself and clarifying that position, you yeah. know, as to, and, and to help him understand. And he went, okay, well, now that makes sense. I said, mm -hmm. yes, you're exactly like your father. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important to explain to our kids when they can understand what we've endured because we, we are going to trigger to them. And my biggest thing was what kids do, they just take your stuff, right? And exactly. because I had things taken from me as a child and then destroyed or given away to somebody else, I had to sit my kids down and tell them that just come and ask. Like it's probably 99.9% .9 of the time going to be a yes but please don't go into my room and take anything without asking because that was a real trigger for me. It was terrible. Yeah. You know, when um, my youngest child, Jacob, uh, when I was really sick, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life and I actually volunteered at a radio station and I had to get these very expensive head um, sets and anyway my back i couldn't sit in the chair for very long and so i had to give it away and my headset was sitting obviously where my son because he did gaming so he went and got my headset when i got them back or when i found them they they were they were in a bad state and i got really upset over it and that was when i really had to share with him why i was so upset anyway i think it was a birthday and um he ended up buying me brand new headset but it wasn't until after he died that i found a note in his room that he had intended to give me that was going you know he's trying to tell me in a letter that you know, like wishing me a happy birthday and he said sorry for being a butthead and destroying your headset that's what he was saying when i found that i still got that letter it was so beautiful but he learned, like, you know, and that was the thing, like, they're kids, they will do things like that. And unfortunately, depending on what our triggers are, you know, we're going to respond to those things. And it's so important for us to look at our language and try not to scare them because we don't want to, I know for me, I never wanted to destroy my children's innocence, like mine was destroyed, but I needed to say things to them so they could understand what was happening yeah. for me you know and i think it's easy to overcompensate as mothers like both of you for example have come out of those very abusive situations and you obviously don't want to inflict that upon your kids so i would imagine that it's quite difficult to find the balance of when do you say no without the guilt because i would imagine that overcompensation to want to be a great mom everything mm. but you don't have examples right you never had examples as kids of what it is to be a great mom at, or and to have a great dad right so mm. you know, and, and that's why i mean i truly believe it's so important that the, there's a mother and a father in my situation i was a single mom and although i've had no abuse or anything like that but it was still the, the, i was a single mom i was the first one in my family ever to have uh, being, being the single mom without the father involved, right? So I really had to figure out what it was. How did I find the balance? And I, there were certain situations I failed dismally, dismally, yeah. failed dismally. Yeah, you know, it's me. easy for me to. Mm. It's e it was easy for me to go into my masculine because I grew grew up in a boarding school basically where we were given the harsh treatment long before we were given the soft treatment, right? So mm -hmm. for me, it was easy to go into the harsh masculine treatment and say, da, 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 you know, and without mm -hmm. realizing he's actually super sensitive child. And it took, you know, that's why I say that between us took, took quite a bit of healing that we had to do.
you know. But definitely got the most amazing granddaughter, and I love my granddaughter. She and I, I mean, I'm like, you know, we're like two peas in a pod, and I, I'm mm. naughtier than what she is, you know. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> grown up to love to know. <laughs> I just do what every granddaughter wants. If she can come, <laughs> Granny goes. She loves it. I love it. Mm. And so I, I tell you, being a grandmother is life's bonus for being a mother. It's the best oh, yeah. feeling ever. That's for sure. Joan, I've got a Jessica too. Have you really? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. That is wow. so precious. My yeah. Jessica, she's such a beautiful mother. Yes. She, so I, I, I fall in love with her more and more every yeah. single day. Yeah. And Dan, my, my yeah. son, but watching her, wow. Yeah. Mm. What I really love about my daughter is she really gets involved with her kids and what they're interested in, and yes. that's what I really love. And, and you know, like if one's interested in craft, she will go out of her way because my grandson wanted to create these little caricatures out of these little balls of the fluff sort of stuff you know like they when easter would come around and they'd have those tiny little yellow little um yes. chickens right but he yes. wanted to make little other little humans out of them with eyes and little top hats and also he made a whole village i kept telling him he would make himself rich if he and she helped him with that and then um my daughter with my granddaughter make their own earrings and things like that out of their crafty stuff and it's just really lovely to walk into their house now, I was such a pristine um, control freak when they were little, right? I, I, everything had to have its place. But I don't mind going in her house and everything's topsy-turvy and she's been sitting there playing with the kids all day, you know, engaged with them. And I really loved that. And I really, when I see that, you know, I know I got something right, <laughs> you know, that yeah, I can enjoy it. And not only that, we're watching them do what should have been, been for us. Right. Yes. Yeah, and we're exactly. seeing those beautiful daughters love yeah, yeah. and cherish their children yeah, the yeah. way we wanted to care and cherish them. And yeah. we could have maybe if it hadn't happened to us. But we do. We're not saying it's, you know, we're, we're less than because we're not. We've had to cope. No. Um, but we can yeah. certainly look and love what our children are doing with their children. Correct. Yeah. My daughter would get horrified at some of the antics I would get up to. So let's yeah. say, okay, so I have a younger son. He's three years younger. And we would go shopping. We'd all do it together. And I would get to, uh, the, you know, where the toilet paper is or the paper towels. And I'd yeah. get my son to run down the end of the aisle. And I would lob it and call incoming and try and land it in the trolley. My daughter would be like going, Mum, stop it, stop it. And the other, the son would be there with the trolley at the end of the aisle <laughs> like this. I have, food, I have food fights at restaurants, right? And uh, oh, wow. hiding under the table. So she would, she'd be mortified, right? But lo and behold, she has children. And what does she want them exposed to? The funny side of grandma. So you know, like we had, um, we played a, a one day I was in a house. One her little boy was only about three or four, and is Isabella, my granddaughter, is a couple of years older. And we were playing a song, and we were dancing in the kitchen, and we all ended up finding things to pretend to be microphones. All of us, even my daughter, and I thought mm -hmm. that was so beautiful because by her having the children stripped away a lot of that. You know, inhibition in the sense that she was feeling embarrassed but it's the one thing I've noticed that she actually doesn't mind the kids being exposed to and they they have fun and my granddaughter's great we've I've gone shopping with her and she's found these um uh like panda heads or something you put on and she'll just walk around with it on her head but yeah. I would do things like you know you go into the toy section and yeah, you have all the dinosaurs from the land before time or something. I'd push yeah. every single button, right? Mm -hmm. all or I'd walk past a rabbit or something, and then I'd be going, "No, no, get off, get off!" Yeah. <laughs> I'd have security called on me because you know I remember. <laughs> do you remember my? Oh, that's fun. Mine, mine, Python, the Holy Grail, the killer rabbit. So I. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
is so good. <laughs> oh, wow. Love- that is so good. Yeah. So that, anyway. that's me. And, I mean, you know, yes, my daughter would be horrified. But, you know, I, but she looks back now and she, I can see her. She's perfectly okay with grandma being silly with the grandkid, with her children. And, yeah. So I see her getting a, a, a quite a bit of joy out of it. So that's good. So I didn't totally, um, you know. <laughs> no, no, I don't think we totally did any. I love it. No. I did and actually, love it. Jess always says to me, Mum, just stop and enjoy your granddaughter. That's yeah, all you have yeah. to do, you yeah, know, and, yeah. oh, how about a blessing. It's so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But I enjoy her as much too. Oh, definitely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The grandkids. Great, but yeah, good fun. Ladies, it's been an absolute blast. Um, and we would definitely are gonna do this again. Um this trio is fantastic, and I look forward to hearing more of your shenanigans, but I don't want to be made jealous again, please. I don't want to hear about any road trips that are happening unless really? I'm present. Well, Jones, oh, you will be in the back seat. It's a photo. Don't 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 quibble now. <laughs> 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 baby kangaroos in there with me okay not just hey, one uh, joan this is the closest I, i've been to a kangaroo <laughs> yay! yay well done gary you're closer than our darling aunt chantel <laughs> 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 oh dear, that's gorgeous make sure it comes for the road trip yeah, okay. right. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> just uh, love it. That's cool. yeah, so, you know. okay. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. Is there anything each of you would like to say just in ending off, just to round up? I thoroughly enjoyed myself tonight, even though we've talked about some really heavy stuff. I think that's really important to um, find the lighter side in it. And, you know, it's so refreshing to actually talk about it in a way that, you know, we're not crying, we're not falling apart. And, yes, we've been a little bit triggered, but you got through it, Joan. Look at that. Yes. And a smile at the yes, end of it. Show you that. There's a way. There are ways, and I've really appreciated, and I've loved getting to know you, Joan. And um, mm. yeah, you okay. too. But one thing I'd like to say, Kerry, my name's Joanne or Joe. Oh, sorry, Joanne. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. I seem to be getting that from everybody lately. They're okay. calling me Joan, and that's okay. my my nana's name. Joan of Arc. Oh, you see, your no, nana's no, name. she's got no Arc here. She might need one if a flood comes, so. though. Hope you've got carpeting skills. Come on, Chantel. Bring that through your porthole. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, ladies. I'm telling you. (laughs) (laughs) Name's important. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Lots of fun, ladies. Mm -hmm. Take good care. And I will see you all later with Bryce when we are doing more of the Romanoff family later on and all their shenanigans. I mean, I love it. Bryce is such a fantastic uh, uh, researcher. I mean, everyone is, we, I think we're all in, in uh, agreement that Bryce should have been all of our history teacher. I mean, she is phenomenal. And Absolutely. I mean, she's got no problem bringing up the scandals. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Lots of fun. Okay, so we'll see you later uh, with the Romanovs. Um, and, um, yeah, lots more happening this week. I haven't put out the weekly schedule yet, but I will be doing so today. God bless you all. Take good care of yourselves. And I'll see you Thanks, very everybody. soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.